Amen. Thank you, Gray. Well, welcome to Salem Chapel. If you're new with us, my name is Johnny Pereira. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here, and we are glad that you're in this auditorium. You're watching us online. You made a good choice to be here today. And I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. Uh, we're in this brand new series that we kicked off last week entitled Different. Now, uh, I would ask you to do this, but I don't want to embarrass anybody, but just think in your mind, how many uh, of you in this room or watching online have ever had someone call you different? Now, raise your hand. You're proud of that, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, what we're looking at in, in this series is, is really maybe defining that word different than maybe what you thought of. Different not in the sense of um, weird or, or uh, pretentious, uh, but different in the sense of understanding uh, from what the Bible has to say that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what I mean by that is not relying on the good that you can do to have a relationship with the Lord, but relying on the perfection that Jesus Christ accomplished on your behalf through his perfect life, his perfect death, and his resurrection, that if you've placed your trust in that today, just as Anastasia declared, as Anik at the 9 a.m. declared in front of her church, that she is a follower of Jesus Christ, that she believes that Jesus is her Lord and Savior, and she wants to declare that through baptism and picturing what Jesus did for her. She God brought her from spiritual death to spiritual life. Like, if that's you today, you're different. And the Bible calls you that. Peter calls it as you are sojourners or you are exiles. And so looking at that idea that we are different, as I said, not in a pretentious way to where we look at someone who hasn't placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as though I'm better than you or different in the sense that I have to act weird or, or let everybody know um, that uh, and be judgmental, that I'm doing things that maybe someone else isn't doing. Not different in that way, but different in the sense of understanding, wait a minute, I am loved by Jesus Christ. I put my trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has changed me. He is changing me. And so what does it look like for me to live different than someone who hasn't placed their trust in Jesus Christ? What does it look like for me to be faithful in a world that's not my final home? That is the thrust, that is the aim, that is the goal, that is what Peter is going after as he writes to these Christian, Jewish Christian believers that are scattered across Asia Minor. It's all being ruled at Rome at the time, where persecution is at, it, as, at its hottest in Rome right now under the emperor Nero. And Peter knows that it's going to spread out across the Roman provinces and that Jewish Christians are going to endure suffering just like those that are in Rome. So what does it look like to endure that, to face that, to not be overwhelmed by that, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually? How do they live different understanding that this world's not their final home? How do you live different understanding that even though, man, like I said last week, I'm thankful that I'm living in this country, in this world. I'm thankful for the state that I live in. I love the house that I live in. I love the family that God has blessed me to be a part of, all those things, and those things are amazing. But this isn't my final home. And neither is it for you as a follower of Jesus Christ. So how do we take that reality and allow it to motivate us to live different and faithfully? That's what we're going after in this series. So 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 12 is where we're going to be this morning. And so hopefully you're there. If you're there, say you're there. Awesome. Three of you are there. Are you there? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for participating with me. I'm not alone up here. 1 Peter 1, verse 6. Let's start there. It's, Peter says this, in this you rejoice. Now, if I'm reading verse 6, my question is, if I haven't read verses 1 through 5, what is Peter referring to? 
So what Peter does is he says, in this, what is this? What he particularly talks about in verses three through five. The this is the living hope that we have been given through Jesus Christ. What he says in verses three through five. Last week we looked at this idea that where you place your hope will affect how you live in this world. And what Peter is emphasizing to a group of people, Christians, that are enduring suffering and know that suffering is coming, that they are going to be tested on whether or not their faith in Jesus Christ is real and it's substantive as they face, whether that be hunger, whether that be persecution, whether that be even at worst case scenario, death. He says, let me tell you what you need to rejoice in. Because obviously, if you're looking to rejoice in what may happen to you, you're going to be in a tough spot. So this is what you rejoice in, the living hope that you've been given through Jesus Christ. It's a living hope that preaches to your present reality. We talked about that last week. That when I understand that I have been given a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me to empower me to live this life differently than someone who doesn't have it, to endure things that others would look and say, how? How could you go through that? That I have a home in heaven awaiting me that I will enjoy for all of eternity, that it's imperishable, undefiled, kept in heaven for me. That when I understand that living hope, when I place my trust in that living hope, here's what happens as I stop in the midst of my present circumstances, especially if they're difficult, and I say, Lord, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna stop And I'm going to take time to praise because when I take time to praise, it opens up my ears to allow that living hope to preach to my present reality. It allows me to listen to the truth rather than the lie that tells me that my circumstances affect whether or not that living hope is true. No, no, I open up my ears as I take time to praise so that living hope preaches that my present reality doesn't define that living hope. And then Paul says, I have a lasting hope. Man, I have an inheritance. See, the this is verses three through five. That's what I rejoice in. And so how does that help me? Well, look at what it says as it continues in verse six. It says, in this you rejoice, the living hope that you've been given, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Here's what you need to embrace You are going to suffer in this world. The extent of that suffering is going to be different. How much you suffer is going to be different. You're like, man, I'm so glad I came to church today. Well, the message doesn't stop there. But we need to embrace the reality that we are going to experience suffering. We're going to experience pain. You know why? Because we live in a sinful world. He says, though now for a little while, he says little while because he's comparing however long they're on this earth to all of eternity. That's why it's a little while. For a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Well, what's the purpose of trials? What's the purpose of suffering? Verse seven, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, him is Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. If you're taking notes this morning, the title is the same that it was last week. This is almost a part two The title is A Different Hope. And you just put dash part two. And here's what I want us to do before we just kind of unpack these amazing verses. Is I want you to pray with me as I pray out loud and just simply pray this. Lord, would would my ears be open to the hope that you want to speak to whatever pain, whatever hurt, whatever suffering I'm going through right now. Pray that with me as I pray out loud. Lord, we're here today. Thank you for the reality that when we open up your word, we don't have to pray that you would speak. But God, we do pray that we would have ears to listen. We would have hearts that would submit to what 
you say to us through your word. And then we would walk out, out of these doors with the power of the Holy Spirit and be obedient to what you have said to us and how you want it to apply it in our lives. Let us not just be people that hear, but let us be people that obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the idea that I want you to get today from these 12 verses. Here it is, or these six verses. Where you find hope directly affects how you will process pain in this world. Last week, we kind of Draw, drew that out about 30,000 feet and said how you live in this world. But, but now we're getting to the practical implications of what I do with this living hope. Like Peter says, we have it. Now we're gonna look at how we apply it. So where I'm finding hope, where I'm looking for hope is going to directly affect how I process pain in this world. Whether that be emotional pain, whether that be physical pain, whether that be pain that you're experiencing spiritually. Because as I said, we live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. God did not create you to know evil. When he created man and woman in the Garden of Eden, he created it perfectly. He put a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he said, don't eat that tree. And when they ate that tree, what happened? They experienced evil. Sin was brought into the world through their disobedience. And ever since that moment, we have had pain experience in our life because of someone else sinning against us, or we have caused pain in someone else's life because we have sinned against them. And we live in this evil world, not because God brought it, but because sin entered the world. And because we live in a sinful world, that's why I'm telling you, and Peter drives home the reality, we live in a sinful world, which means we are going to encounter trials. We are going to encounter pain, whatever pain that may be. But how does the Lord use that pain and take what is bad and create it for good, Romans 8, 28, to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And where you look for hope will directly affect how you process that pain. So many of us, when we experience pain, whether that's done to us or whether we've done that to someone else, it's done to us, we experience the hurt of that. We do it to someone else, we experience the hurt and the guilt and the shame of that. And what do we so often do? We want to gravitate to things that maybe numb our pain. We want to gravitate to things that cause us to escape from our pain so that we don't have to deal with it. And what I want to encourage you with today is Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is going to give us the way that we process pain when we experience it. And every one of us have, and every one of us will, and it doesn't mean that we go look for it, but when it comes, how do we process it? That's what we're going to look at today. He says in verse 6 that for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. I just want to quickly give you four categories of trials in the New Testament. I think it's important that we see these. They're up on the screen, all of them. There's trials that test your trust in God's provision. We see that in Hebrews 3, 7, and 8. The writer of Hebrews speaks to the children of Israel who experienced a time of testing, wandering around in the wilderness. You ever been in that place where you're in a time of testing to, man, do I really trust in God's provision? I feel lost. I, I, I feel like I lack his provision. I feel like I'm not seeing God's power at work. I feel like uh, I'm not... I'm not experiencing the position that I should. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see God's protection in this. Yeah, there's, there's trials that test your trust in God's provision. There's trials that test your trust in God's word. Luke 8, 13 speaks of the sower and the seed and that, and that when, when the heat comes and it, it really ref shows, is my faith legitimate or not? There's times where I have to be faced with, do I trust God's word? 
Like I'm being obedient to God's word, but my motives are being questioned. I'm being judged that my motives are impure, but I'm trusting, no, 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 this is what God's word says, and I want to be obedient. But oftentimes, we may experience suffering in some way, pain, judgment, whatever it may be. Those tests, whether you really believe God's word is God's word. There's trials that test your trust in God's purposes. Galatians 4, 3, and 4, Peter, Paul speaks about all the things that have been done to his physical body because he's preached the gospel. He's done a great thing, and yet he's experienced all of these different things. Man, he's had to, he's had to trust in the midst of that testing that God has a purpose that's greater than his. Some of you may be facing physical suffering. You've been diagnosed with something. Someone you love has been diagnosed with some terminal disease or something else and, and you're trying to make sense of that and you're like, God, where's your purpose in this? I can't see it. That tests whether or not you really believe in the purposes of God and then there's trials that test your trust in God's power. God, can you really do this? Can you really come through? Do you really transcend this circumstance? I mean, Matthew 26, 40 and 41, Jesus is in the garden. What does he say to his disciples? I mean, he has all the weight of the world on his shoulders. He knows that he's about to go to the cross, and he says to his disciples, hey, could you stay awake with me? Knowing that the temptation is, is here, it's near. Even the Son of God was setting us an example on what it looks like to trust in God's power in the midst of a trial or a test. And once again, let me draw your attention to verse seven. What's the purpose of trials? What's the purpose that can be greater than just the immediate pain that I'm experiencing? What, how there could be there a purpose in this time of suffering? Here it is in verse seven. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold. What he's saying here is your faith in Jesus is even worth more than physical possessions. And it's precious to God. And he gives this analogy of gold and going through a furnace. You know, times of suffering can feel like a forge. One of the shows that I've gotten like like watching on Netflix is this show called Forged in Fire. Like, I am not a blacksmith, nor do I ever desire to be one. But I don't know, it's this idea of they take this metal and all kinds of weird stuff. And they have, to, they have to put it in a fire in the forge and they have to heat it up and they have to bang it out and all this stuff. And then at the end of the, end of the show, you have this amazing looking sword but the sword didn't look like that at the beginning. And it went through fire and it went through beating and they put it back in the fire again because there's a warp. So I gotta put it back in the forge again and I gotta do all of these different things so that at the end it'll produce something that is beautiful and can actually, it will cut. If you've watched that show, you know that. But the only reason that's able to happen is because of the process. And in many ways, that's what Peter is saying here. It's a testing. It's a forge. Is it painful? Yeah. Did God cause it? No. Is it because of sin? Yes. But God's going to use what is bad and use it for the good so that you can be who he wants you to be. You know, you think of people that you admire, right? It doesn't even have to be someone who's a believer. It really is true in any way, but especially true of a follower of Jesus Christ. But anybody that you admire, anybody that's done th anything amazing, if you're into athletics, whatever the person is that you admire, it's no secret I love Michael Jordan. Sometimes some may think unhealthily, but... I mean, I've watched The Last Dance, good gracious, more times than I want to admit. But you know what I loved most about that documentary? It was showing the work that it took 
to the results. You have your favorite businessman, you have your favorite person that's in Forbes magazine, I don't care who it is. You know what I've found? The more and more people that I've talked to that have accomplished great things, they all had to learn how to endure obstacles and break through them. I would love to tell you here today that you can experience the mountaintops of life without going through the valleys, but the reality is that's not the case, and it's even more so true in your Christian life. No, no, it's those times of suffering and how you react that make you, that make you into the man or the woman that God wants you to be. I wanna give you three things this morning that the testing of your faith produces. In the time that we have left, three things that are, according to this passage of Scripture in verse 7, to the praise and the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. That when these things are produced and are being produced in you, they give praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because it's not natural for you to react that way when you're hurt, when you experience pain whether that be pain that you've committed or pain that you've experienced. Here's the first one, and it's found in the beginning of verse eight, a deepening love for Jesus Christ. He says in verse eight, though you've not seen him, you love him. Can you just read those last three words with me? I'm gonna read the first part. You read the second part together. Let's try this, and we're gonna continue to do this throughout the message. Though you have not seen him, say these three words with me, you love him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So that word love that we see here in this passage of scripture, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ or if you spend any time in church or in the Bible at all, you're probably familiar with this term. It's the Greek word for love named Agape, it's a selfless love. It's not a love that's an eros love. That's another word for love in the Greek that's a physical type of love. It's not a phileo love. A, that's another Greek word for love, a brotherly love. No, no, this is a selfless love. So Peter is saying, even though I want to acknowledge the reality that you've never seen Jesus, and yet you love him. He's encouraging them with what they are facing or what they are about to face. Here's why I think that is so interesting. Because Peter was a disciple of Jesus. Peter saw Jesus. Peter was literally called by Jesus when, when, when Jesus said to him, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter laid down his nets and he followed Jesus. He spent three years with Jesus. He was in the inner circle with Jesus with James and John. He saw so many miracles that Jesus did with his own eyes. He also had low points. He betrayed Jesus. But then later he was restored by Jesus. When he was at his lowest point and he realized that Jesus loved him in spite of what he did. And Jesus gave him a marching order to go and to take the gospel that had changed Peter to the whole known world. I make that a point because Peter saw Jesus. So Peter's writing these words to a group of Christians that had not seen Jesus, and Peter acknowledges and praises the reality that you love him even though you haven't seen him. I love him, and I have seen him. Because Peter understands this, that seeing Jesus with your eyes is not where your foundation with Jesus rests. It's not. So Lori's not in this room today. Lori's my wife, if you don't know. And so we've been married 21 years. And the first time that I saw her was in the fall semester of my junior year. I was with my buddies. We were walking to dinner. And uh, we were walking one way. And Lori and her friends were walking the other way. And the guys that I was was with, they knew Lori. And they knew Lori's friends. I was the only one in the group of guys that didn't know anybody. So I'm kind of standing there to the side while they have a conversation. You know, you've ever been there, how awkward that is? And so I'm just standing there, and the whole time, you know what I'm thinking? Who's that girl? It's like, man, she got a nice tan. Like, I wasn't dating anybody at the time. And I was like, man, I want to get to know her more. So when the conversation ended and my bros and I are going to dinner, I'm asking them, hey, who's that girl? And her name's Lori, and I'm like, 
well, is she dating anybody? And they're like, no, I think she got out of a relationship. I was like, okay, so do some reconnaissance for me. Like, it's been a long time for some of us, but if you're young, you know how that game works, right? <laughs> Ladies, I'm telling you, guys are extremely insecure, and it takes a heaven and hell to cause us to ask somebody out, I'm just telling you. That's free, that's not, that's not tied to the message at all. And so I, I remember what, what so they, they found out for me and found out that she wasn't dating anybody, but her roommates, I did know, and they knew I wanted to ask her out. So we are uh, at a big soccer game at the college that we were at, and they run over. I'm walking to the game. They're all across on the other side of the field. They come running towards me to say, no, you need to ask her out, you need to ask her out. And I see that she sees what they're doing. I'm like, well, I can't like chicken out now. So I walk over there, and it's a long walk, and as I'm walking over there, her ex-boyfriend starts talking to her, so I just, I mean, I can't turn around, right? That would be bad. So I just stand there, and I wait until he's done, and I ask her out in front of him. <laughs> Thank you. Here's why I say that. And it's worked out pretty well. <laughs> is because what, it, what attracted me to her, I saw her. I didn't see her and say, I love you. But if you were to look and sit us both down, I know she would say the same thing and say, why do you love her? Why do you love him? Yes, I'm very thankful that my wife's attractive. Don't get me wrong. But our relationship isn't built on that anymore. You know what our relationship is built upon? Time. This time together. Enduring struggles together. Having to forgive one another. Having moments of victory together. Having moments of failure and pain. Whether that's me committing pain to her or vice versa times of giving and receiving. Why do I mention that? Because it's a pale illustration in comparison to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Peter is saying, listen to me, just because you haven't seen Jesus doesn't mean that you can't still love him. In fact, what makes you love him is not even that you saw him with your two eyes. It's how you've seen the effects that it's had in your life, how it's keeping you grounded, how it's given you the strength to endure how it's given you the ability to do things that you can't take credit for and react in ways that you can't take credit for. What do trials do? What do they produce? What is the forge of suffering for? How do you make purpose out of pain that's committed to you or that you've done against someone? You understand it is an opportunity that the God wants to use in your life to deepen your love for him. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. 99% of the weddings that I do use this verse. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That word for love is agape, selfless. And as I've grown in my relationship with Jesus Christ, and as you've grown in your relationship with Jesus Christ, and as you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, that verse becomes more and more real to you. Because you can look back and you're like, man, what got me through that? My relationship with Jesus. What got me through that? The forgiveness that I realized that Jesus offered me in spite of the pain that I caused someone else to experience. I understand in a new way, in a greater way, in a deeper way, what that verse means and other verses that speak of Christ's love for me. You know what we need to pray if you're experiencing suffering this morning? If you're experiencing pain? It's this prayer. Lord, would you deepen my love for you in the midst of this trial? You know, there's certain prayers that you don't have to wonder if God's gonna answer it like you want. Like there's plenty of prayers that I've prayed and I can say, Lord, I'm thank so thankful that you said no in that thing, in that situation that I wanted. But this is a prayer that God will answer the way that you desire when you pray it. Lord, would you deepen my love for you in the midst of this trial? Here's the second thing that the testing of your faith produces. A resolute trust in Jesus Christ. 
because he continues in verse eight. He says, though you've not seen him, you love him. We've looked at that. It says, though you do not now see him, say the next four words with me. You believe in him. Do that again. Though you do not now see him, say it with me, you believe in him. Trials strengthen trust. It's a reality of the Christian life. It's what they do. But I don't know if you caught this or not. Did you see that in verse 8, the beginning, Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. But now he says, though you do not now see him. See, I think the first part he's speaking to when they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's a part of it. Where you came to a place to realize, wow, God loves me in spite of the sin that I've committed. That there's nothing good that I can do to ever warrant a relationship with Jesus Christ because God is holy and perfect and I'm sinful. So if I commit one sin, I've fallen short of that standard of perfection that God has created. But Jesus Christ loved me enough to come and to put on human flesh, to live and die and be risen for my sins. Man, that's love. That's 1 John 4. And this is love. Not that we love but God, but that God sent Jesus to be the propitiation or the payment for my sin and so I start out understanding the Lord's love for me in whatever simplistic way I do even in a way a child can but I grow in understanding my love for him deepens but now he focuses on though you do not now see him you believe in him you know what's so hard when you're going through times of pain and suffering to see what God's doing Right? You feel like he's absent. You feel like he doesn't care. You struggle to believe that he's trustworthy. God, what are you doing? What are you doing in this? I can't see. I've tried to see, and I can't see right now what you're doing. Peter acknowledges the reality of the Christian life that there are times in your life where you don't see him. But he commends these Christians, but yet you are believing in him. And here's what we need to understand that happens during testing, during trial, is it moves you from a place where you believe things about God, and it moves you to a place where now you are put in the forge to not believe about God, but to believe in God. There is a major difference. Look, listen, I got a master of divinity, and I don't say that in a prideful way because I know very little compared to most, but I can study all the theology in the world and read all the books in the world and all the different things about God and the Trinity and all the questions that make me scratch my head and cure my insomnia at night. I can do all of those things, and that's good that we need to grow in that knowledge. But the Christian life is not knowing about God, not believing things about God, but the Christian life is when you are put through different circumstances, hard things, obstacles, suffering, is it brings you to a place where you have to take what you believe about God and say, do I believe in God? And the Christian life is about my belief continuing to grow like a muscle, that it gets stronger and stronger and stronger over time to where you're looking and like, there's no way I can pick up that 100-pound barbell of faith. But God knows that. So he starts you off at a 5, and a 10, and a 20. Because he's growing your belief, not just about him, but in him. Listen, God's brought me to a place of healing. This is why I share this. But 2019 was the hardest year of ministry in my entire life. Entire life. And it's interesting that if you were here in 2019, we kicked off a series in January in Psalm 23. How do you remember that? The series was titled Unafraid. And I remember praying this prayer, and I prayed it publicly before we would look at it for each verse. God, would you help us to experience, to learn, 
to believe in Psalm 23 in a way that we never had before. You ever pray a prayer that you regret praying? That would be, at the time, one of those prayers. And I was just dealing with a lot. I mean, our church was part of a network that totally collapsed. You know, in 2016, we moved our family from Naples, Florida. I was pastor, had the privilege of being a pastor at a large church, a significant ministry. God had done a lot of things. God had, in, the, in 2015, provided a home for us, brand new home, miraculously, through the generosity of people. We were happy. Ministry was happening. And then all of a sudden, we felt this tinge that God was asking us to pray to be willing to leave it all if he wanted us to. And we had no idea where that was. And so, reluctantly, Lori and I prayed that. And to make somewhat of a, to make a long story somewhat short, all of a sudden we heard about this network and, and this church in Winston-Salem and we felt like, you know what, we need to go visit it and we ended up selling everything, selling our home, moving. And when 2019, when that network completely collapsed, Like, I was, I was at a crisis. Because I was like, I just moved my entire family and left something that I thought was pretty grand for a sham. I struggled with that. And just navigating through all the implications of all of that and feeling the pressure of just how do I lead my family through that? Being, feeling responsible. How do I lead, how do we lead the church, that all those different things all compounded at once. And I had, was faced with a decision in this time of pain and time and suffering for me that many of you probably were never aware of on how do I deal with it. Do I run? Or do I embrace it and learn to trust in it and deepen my love for Jesus in it? How do I react? And by God's grace, obviously we're still here. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, seriously, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I I appreciate that. That's not why I'm saying this. I want you to hear this. So in that moment, I remember Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Before any of this happened, I remember lying down on this stage and saying, lying down, here's what it means. Back on the floor, eyes can only look up. And you know, I can look back on that time because now going through healing and, and, and having people help me in this and, and help me resolve some of this where I was, man, my trust was really tested. Like, like God, I struggle right now seeing you. But man, to be able to look back and be so thankful for the lessons that I learned. To be so thankful that I can stand here today and my faith in believing in the Lord has a long way to go. But to be able to say, Lord, I thank you so much that it was in that time that, man, you put me through the forge and my belief in you, I can point to that time and say it's so much stronger today because of what you allowed us to go through. And why do I share that? I share that with you. So there could be countless people that could come on this stage today that are in this church that are going right through my mind right now that have stories of so much more suffering that pales in comparison with anything in that regard that have had to live this out, that have been faced with a choice, am I going to submit or am I going to turn my back? And when you understand, when you submit, what you gain is a resolute trust in Jesus Christ. It's solid. It's strong. It will cut. Here's the second thing that we need to pray. Lord, would you produce a resolute trust in you in the midst of this trial? I promise you God will answer. 
He will give you that. Here's the third thing. The testing of your faith produces, it produces a supernatural joy through Jesus Christ. A supernatural joy. Look at what it says in the end of verse 8. It says, though you do not see him, you believe in him. But then it says, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, here's the part that just transparently speaking, I don't like, but it's a reality. That for whatever reason, joy and suffering seem to always go together in the Bible. Like, it's a sandwich that I never want to ask for on a menu. I'm never going to say, oh, I take some joy and suffering. In fact, make that a double. <laughs> None of us would. What I think is interesting is joy and suffering so often is inseparable. It's, in, it's counterintuitive. It's not meant to be insensitive, but it's driving home a reality just like James 1, 2 through 4 says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Joy is so much different than happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances. Like, like you may go to your favorite restaurant after church today, and you know what you should be? Happy. And you don't need to be ashamed of that. There's a lot of things that make me happy. I don't push away those. I, I want to be happy. But joy is different. Joy is not based on circumstances. Joy is sourced in something supernatural. And he says, count it all joy. Why? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It doesn't mean perfect as sinless. But God's doing something in you. He's forging you in the fire. Like I said, all of us want the result, but so often we run away from the process. And when the process comes, we got to know how to respond. And we allow that living hope of what we have in Jesus Christ and that that's where our faith is anchored in Jesus. If you love me enough to live, die, and be risen for my sins, then that's what makes you trustworthy. Then that's what makes me trust in your power. Then that's what makes me trust in your provision. That that, then that's what makes me trust in your purposes. And so I'm going to submit. And I'm gonna endure it with the strength of the Holy Spirit so my love is deepened with you, so my trust is resolute in you, so I have a supernatural joy that can't be explained in human terms. Trials produce a joy that cannot be explained in the world's vocabulary. And this joy is not filled with things that fade away. What I love, look at that verse again. It says, joy that is inexpressible and it's filled with glory. In other words, if you were to think of joy as a container, and you were to take the top of that container off and look at the substance that made up joy, you know what you're not going to see? You getting a raise at work. You're not going to see, man, I got a bigger house. I got a nice car. I got a new phone. I got some new clothes. I got this scholarship. I got, I got into this school. Not that any of those things are bad. Those are circumstances that make you happy. But what's in the container of joy? What's in the container of joy is your love deepening when it doesn't make sense. When people hurt you, when they betray you, when they damage you as the world would see it. And yet in the midst of that pain, you have enough trust in the Lord to endure that and navigate through that. And allow God's word to speak to that. And allow others in your life who point you to God's word to minister to you in that. That's what you see in that cylinder of joy. What you see in that cylinder of joy is you being able to step out in faith and to to do what doesn't make sense and to do what seems silly and unreasonable, but yet you're like, no, this is what the Lord wants me to do, and I'm going to endure that trial and testing in God's provision, and I'm going to grow in my idea and understanding and belief in him, not about him. That's what's inside of that cylinder of joy. Those are the things that bring God glory because those are the things that don't make sense to a world that doesn't know Jesus. That's why it's inexpressible. To be able to have a life that's filled with those stories, man, that gives substance. 
That gives depth to who you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ. See, joy is filled with God moments, miracles where your faith grew and was refined and forged in the fire of circumstance to produce something that you can't take credit for but gives the glory to the one who has changed you and is changing you and will one day make all things new. You know what we need to pray? Lord, would you fill me with a supernatural joy in the midst of this trial? That's what we need to pray. And verses 10 through 12 says this. Peter says, concerning this salvation, like, there's not a better description of what you have in Jesus Christ than these verses, verses 3 through, three through 10. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Spirit who sent from heaven. What is that saying? Peter is saying there were people before you in the Old Testament that prophesied of Jesus coming, of this salvation that you now obtain and have put your belief in. There's disciples that have preached this gospel and have suffered for this gospel. And they've done it. And they've suffered so that you can have the gospel and have the substance and have the hope that allows you to be able to process the pain. I mean, I can't lead others to a place that I'm not going myself. And the beautiful thing is, is when you process the pain through your living hope, it doesn't just grow you, but it gives you the opportunity to grow other people's faith as well. Because they look and they're like, wow, what makes him or her different than me? It's only Jesus. I believe in Jesus. So that fear means that I can endure things the way that you're enduring them. And what I love, it says, these are the things into which the angels long to look. I love this phrase because it literally, I don't know how it looks, but this is, I, I, I see things in pictures. I'm literally picturing the, he, the angels all around gazing down into our world and like saying to God, really God? You want to use Johnny? Like seriously? You want to use Susie? You want to use Matt? You want to use John? You want to use Deborah? Really? And God just saying, oh, no, no, no. You see them as what they are. I see them as what they will be. I see them through the forge. Listen to me, pain and suffering cannot be avoided. And so to tell you on how to live life so that you can avoid, ab, avoid every amount of pain, it's not possible. I'd be telling you a lie. It's not that you look for it. But what God says out of his grace is how do we endure it when we encounter it? How do we endure it when we commit it against someone else? And how do we endure it when it's committed against us? How do we see it as an opportunity for God to make us in who he wants us to be. Would you pray with me? God, we're here today. And I know so many people in this room and watching online are struggling on what to make sense of the things that they are enduring. Whether that be financially because of 2020 and the consequences of the virus, whether it's losing someone in this last year, whether it's relational pain, Lord, I don't know what it is, but God, I pray that your word today would give guidance and direction on how we process pain when it comes into our life. And we thank you for the hope, the living hope, the lasting hope that's found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in 
his mighty and powerful and forgiving and gracious name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?